Who took the cow out of the pasture, away from the grass, and put her in a muddy feedlot to fatten rapidly? Nature made the cow to eat grass, only grass. No pills, no hormone shots, no computerized fattening process. Purely natural, healthy beef, as nature intended. That's next on Chefs of Field. Jardiniere of San Francisco, a place the food critics like a lot. The restaurant of Tracy Desjardins, acclaimed chef, winner of an esteemed James Beard Award, culinary activist. It's really important to me to know how products are handled, and so getting to go out there and, and see that farm makes a big difference. It, you know, it gives us a, one step closer to the products that we're working with. Her cooking evolves, too, at a second restaurant, the Acme Chop House. Young and energetic and firmly committed to healthy, wholesome taste. We have to realize that we're depleting many great resources and that we really need to pay attention to what the environmental impact is of food producing. And that's why it's a very important issue to me and why it's really important to me to know about where your food's coming from and how it's being raised. So where's the beef coming from? To find out, she saddles up Go look at some cattle? Yeah, let's go take a look. And what we're going to do is we're going to move them to another pasture. I'm ready. And then goes into the garden to peek at what is under the fancy French blanching hats. It doesn't have the sunlight, so it stops the chlorophyll. Right. Guess we're ready, huh? It is the 10 Bar Ranch. Wayne Langston, horseman, steward of the land, purveyor of grass fed natural beef. Here, Chef Tracy Desjardins is at home in the saddle raised on the family farm in California's Great Central Valley. The chef as wrangler, rancher, cattle hand. So how old are these uh, cows you have out here right now? Well, this is kind of, this is stage one, pretty much, of the whole program. Uh -huh. um, most of these calves out here were born last uh, spring, uh -huh. about March. Some of them in February, some of the bigger ones. Um, what they're doing here is basically they're going through the growing stage still with their moms. They're here with the cows and uh, they'll stay on these cows probably till this fall. So how long have they been grazing in these fields here? Probably in this field somewhere around three weeks now. And what we do is we, we move them from field to field. It's called rotations. And what we'll do is they've been in this field for about three weeks now and they've pretty much eaten all of the valuable plants, and you can see how close down to the ground they've eaten this. Yeah, it doesn't look like so there's much left. There's not, and what, what we need to do now is we need to move them to another pasture that's been rested and grown up uh -huh. and has all those valuable plants in that stage to where they can go in there and keep right on gaining weight, grazing those plants in the way they should. So you're getting ready to change these cattle over to the yeah. longer grass? Yeah, see, down here I'll show you. So this fresh grass is what's giving the grass-fed flavor, the, the flavor that's unique to these animals that are finished on grasses versus those that are finished on grain? Yeah, it does. What it is is it's a, it's a difference in the chemical of the, com, composition of the fat that they're putting on. So we've had a lot of people coming in and asking for grass-fed meat, mm -hmm. which is great that we can serve it to them. And we've done a lot of taste tests. We did that initial tasting with, with you guys right. uh, to taste your product, and we just found you know, a decided difference in, in the flavor. Mm -hmm. um, the grass-fed meat, it's just it's completely different. Uh, if, you, if you really pay attention to the flavor, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's hard to describe. I guess it's the difference between you know, a green vegetable and, say, corn or some kind of grain you really have that sort of green that green flavors in, in the meat. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it to be really juicy. With the grass-fed meat that we're eating now, you can eat, and you can eat portions of it, and you can get all done, and you can say, you know, I feel really good, but I don't feel like I overdid it. I don't feel stuffed. Uh, I, I just feel better after I get done eating this this meat compared to the, to the other grain-fed side of it. 
um, this is something I didn't think I'd ever say. You know, yeah. this was just, this was what we were thought was supposed to happen all those years. 50 years ago, America's great abundance of grains gave cattlemen the chance to fatten animals for market in a year and a half. Why wait for grass to grow, for a steer to take three years to gain weight? Feed them in lots, fatten them fast, and move on. Grass-fed steak, the energy that's involved is what it takes her to take a step and eat a bite of grass. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. the energy involved. When you talk about grain-fed beef, there's almost, I think there's, the statistics have proven there's over 200 gallons of fuel right. that goes into processing grain to right. put on a pound of gain in a grain-fed animal the way a ruminant animal, a okay. cow, a deer, an elk, mm -hmm. uh, a sheep, goat, those types of things, they can make really efficient use of stuff that just grows out of the earth. Yeah. Um, there's no other animal alive that can do that type of thing. They can produce a product, they can produce beef from what naturally grows out of the earth. And their whole digestive system is a really unique system. By doing what we're doing, we're just utilizing that system. We're, we're, we're peaking that system in an animal with peaking plants to get it done. It just, it's all just the natural way to do it. It's really a shame that it ever changed at all and that people started uh, feeding these animals grain. Looks like they're kind of getting hungry. You got time to help me move them into another sure, pasture? Sure, give it a shot. Okay. Tell me what to do. Well, we'll just kind of get up here and get everything kind of moving in the right direction and see if we can't put them through a gate. All right, excellent. For Wayne Langston, the true cattleman has his eyes not on a balance sheet, but on the ground. A good rancher spends as much time looking at the ground and looking at the grass as he does his cattle, because that's where his livelihood is really coming from, is coming out of the ground. And any rancher that is a good steward of the land takes as good a care of the land as he does of the cows. It's necessary. We're probably some of the most fortunate people in the world out here. We get to be out here, we get to be doing what we love, we get to be doing what we've grown up doing. I honestly feel like I've never had a job in my life. I'm doing exactly what I love to do. A lot of people aren't that fortunate. In the same way that Cattleman Langston issues antibiotics and hormones, thus would farmer Warren Weber of Star Root Farms happily surrender a row of lettuce to invading aphids. He would plow it under before he'd use a chemical spray. So you want to check out what some yeah, of these we're doing? Yeah, let's see what you've got here. Well, you know, it's early spring, so we have a few things going now. Now, I, I, I think you, you've been getting these, the little, these, little, these gems. little gems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And everything else here is at an earlier stage, but these are growing, these are a little more advanced. And um, let me see if I can get some that are ready. Get one that's ready and we'll show. I love these. I've been buying these at the farmer's market from your stand. Tracy has come to see Warren Weber in one of his gardens, a 35-acre farm just north of San Francisco, beside the sea in Bolinas, California, home of leafy greens, carrots, herbs, onions, and other organic edibles. It is California's oldest certified organic farm. I don't know what you do with these, but maybe... I like them like with a little enchoad, real simple, you know, or see, even, even, even for like Caesar, they're fantastic. There's a ladybug. There you go. It's a friendly critter. There's bugs and there's bugs, you know. Farmers always think of the good bugs and the bad ones. Pests uh -huh. and the predators, and they eat the pests. But um, they are all in just a relationship that we try to kind of understand and uh, embrace because they're all part of the chain of the ecosystem, the ecosystem yeah. and the kind of the chain of being that's part of the success of these plants. Well, whenever I get I a bug in my lettuce one. in the restaurant, I always just tell people, well, you know it's organic. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know <laughs> that doesn't yeah. help that much. That though. doesn't help. You know, that's, that's the old days. Yeah. In, in the old days, you know, when you brought things in, the potatoes, if they were really funky and... They, Holy. Yeah, then people yeah. say, oh, well, that's good. That's what I want because I know those weren't right. sprayed. Well. That's fine, but the organic industry has changed a lot over the years, and now the cosmetics are important. Warren Weber has been at this digging, weeding, and harvesting for more than a quarter century. It was while he was majoring in English lit at Berkeley, says Weber, that farming was my long-haired hippie ambition. And tell me about the little caps. Well, these are called, they're called blanching caps, uh -huh. and these are actually from France. They're sort of a rubberized, 
material that has UV inhibitors in it. Uh -huh. So uh, they last for a long time. We've had these for a lot of years now. Wow. And um, they let the heat out uh -huh. the center there. So some air comes out. You put them on in this climate about a week before you want to actually harvest. You got to let the plant get big. And, and you put them on. Does, it, does the green actually turn to yellow? No, it just stops producing. Uh -huh. It can't, doesn't have the sunlight, so it stops the chlorophyll. Right. I just love the just the inner yeah, part I, like that. Yeah, at the restaurant, we, we pick it down so there's basically no green yeah, left on it at right, all. Yeah, right, right, right. Mm. And it does very well here. Mm -hmm. And I love freeze. I mean, I don't know. I, I love, I I love just a frise salad. Mm -hmm. Just, just frise. It's a fantastic would, green because it's so hearty. Yeah. Um, you can you know you can heat it a little bit. It can you can definitely right. stand up to warm salads and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. You want to check out some romaine? Yeah, let's check it out. Okay. Um, so we're doing Ow. these now. These are the, these are hard. So so it's we're, so we're funny because they're so big. Yeah, they're big, but yeah. these are these are closing in pretty well. Okay. So we'll peel this back. Gosh, it seems so wasteful when you see it I know, <laughs> done out here. <laughs> it's all going back into the earth, it is, though, right? Yeah. You know, there's uh, little spring onions over there. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's some, there's some uh, white spring onions. You know, it's interesting. But when I started, I don't think people were buying bulb onions. Bulb onions with the tops. Yeah. See, they, I... you know, and now, and now they do. Where does all of this fit? What roles do chef and farmer play in the supply of food in this world? So what I'm starting to think about more is, is the whole issue of sustainability and you know, not only where the product is coming from and how it's being raised, is, but the environmental impact of it being transported to the restaurants. That means that the more you think about that, the better the chances are that the small, medium-sized farms that have always been part of our culture in various regions have a chance. The more people can be discerning and make distinctions and see how things are done, then they can choose. Yeah. They make these choices intelligently. Well, my priorities have shifted over the last few years, I guess. I have a two-year-old son, and uh, he's kind of the center of my universe now. So I guess I've, I've started to think a little bit more about what the future looks like, and through my cooking, I've become uh, more of an activist and more involved in, in um, the idea of what the future is of, of our country, and, and particularly how it relates to food, um, because that's my world. Back in the 80s when I started training, we were really uh, focused on what we could find from around the world that was exotic and wonderful. But as I've been in the Bay Area for the last 11 years, my cooking has evolved more towards locality and seasonality and, and the things that we can get that really come from this great growing region that we live in here. I'm going to do a very simple menu that's sort of based all around the, the grilled um, grasslands beef. Um, these are the spring onions that we dug out of the field last night. And these are some um, German butterball potatoes. They're similar to a yellowfin potato. Um, they're available uh, this time of year in this area. They're spring dug potato fresh out of the ground. So I'm going to get my pan hot with just a little bit of pure olive oil. I'm going to start cooking the potatoes in there, and then I'll add the onions in. Timing is kind of important on this. The potatoes take probably about twice as long to cook as the onions do, so you put the onions in halfway through. And I'm also going to make a little salsa verde, or my version of it, um, for the steak. Let your pan get nice and hot just before it starts to really smoke. And it's a good idea to take it off the fire so that your oil doesn't catch on fire. Here I've got a New York steak. This is the uh, grassland beef. Um, you can see by the size of the steak that it's a pretty small animal. Um, we talked a little bit with um, Wayne about the size of the animals being smaller than the grain-fed beef. Um, and it's reflected in the, the diameter of the steak. You don't see as much marbling usually in the meat. And it does cook a little bit differently. It cooks faster, for one thing. Um, it takes less time to cook, probably about 20% less time. Um, and the meat ha tightens up a little bit more, so it's a good idea to let it rest uh, so that, that the, the uh, fibers relax again and the meat's nice and tender. So I'm going to season this with a little bit of salt and pepper. And then one of the things that I like to do, really with all my steaks, whether I'm cooking them in a pan or over a live fire, is to take a little bit of 
fresh garlic and thyme and seep that in a little bit of whole butter and baste meat with that. If it's cooking in a pan, I do it with a spoon. Cooking on the grill, I use a, um, a little brush and just keep basting that. So you don't have to peel the garlic. Um, it's just going to be in the butter for a little bit of flavor. And I'm going to add this fresh thyme also. And I'm just going to heat this up gently. And that's going to make a nice basting oil for the steak. Potatoes are starting to brown nicely. Starting to cook a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put the onions in. Season everything as I go along with salt and pepper. And I'm going to place these in the oven to cook. And if the steak is nice and thick, I like to start it on the fat side first so that that fat sort of sizzles and renders off. And um, it's my favorite part. One of the wonderful things about the grasslands beef is that the fat is very clean. It doesn't leave a residue in your mouth. Um, if you do like to eat the fat and gristle part of a steak, it's a really great clean flavor. All right, so the little sauce that I'm going to make for this steak um, is a little salsa verde. And that's going to be chopped garlic, tarragon, chervil, Italian parsley, capers, anchovy, and garlic with a little olive oil and a tiny bit of lemon juice. A great way to chop garlic is to uh, use a little bit of salt and take the edge of your knife, kind of crush it. That helps bring out some of the flavor of the oils in the garlic. Place that into a mixing bowl. I'm going to chop a little bit of caper. I'm do a little bit of uh, anchovy. Finely chopped. Anchovy is a, a great seasoning. Um, in the south of France, they use anchovies to stud with leg of lamb when they cook it. And uh, the first time I ever heard that, I thought it was a really odd thing, the idea of, of taking a salty little fish and putting it with meat. Um, but it's, it kind of works in the same way that, uh, that like Vietnamese uh, fish sauce works, that it gives a great complexity, sort of a salty flavor, and a little added flavor. You don't, you don't, it's not discernible as being anchovy, but it's got this uh, wonderful uh, complexity to it that I really like. Chopped anchovy, and I'm going to take some Italian parsley, chop that up finely. The steak has a nice golden brown edge on it, and I'm going to go ahead and, and lay it flat on the grill now and make some nice grill hash marks on it, let it sear quickly. This sauce also gets a little fresh tarragon and chervil that are chopped. All the flavors blend together in this sauce just to kind of be this wonderful accent to the grilled meat. You sort of get some of those flavors individually, but to, all together, they really, they're really quite wonderful. Some extra virgin olive oil. Just a dash, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like a pesto. Salt and pepper. And some lemon juice. I'm going to baste the steak with a little of the uh, butter mixture. I'm going to check in on my potatoes and onions. I'm going to 
to cook those until the potatoes are nice and tender and the uh, onions are tender all the way through. And check them with a knife, just like you would a baked potato. I'm going to add just a little bit of whole butter and a tiny bit of water. That'll help the potatoes and the onions uh, really cook through so that they're sort of steamed. Um, the water will completely evaporate out and they'll, they'll begin to caramelize again. Stick this back in the oven for a bit. Flip my steak one more time. Give it another little baste. Pull my potatoes and onions out of the oven, and I'm going to add a little bit of chopped fresh thyme to those. Let them cook just a little bit more. My steak should be just about ready here. rest a little bit. It doesn't melt as much as a corn-fed uh, beef product would. Um, it kind of, it stays a little bit tighter. It doesn't lose as much of its original shape. Um, and it, it feels, it actually feels a little bit juicier. Let that rest a bit. I'm a big proponent of, of letting meat rest. Allows all the juices to reabsorb into um, the meat and the muscles to relax a little bit, and you get a tender, more tender, more juicy, and with a, a more consistent temperature throughout. And the last, uh, last I checked them, they were almost there, so now I know that they're uh, ready to go. Got to let out a little bit of color on them. And I'm going to take the steak, slice it. That's a nice, beautiful, medium rare steak. Take a little bit of my uh, salsa verde and just uh, drizzle that on the plate. Last thing I'm going to do is season the meat with just a little bit more uh, fleur de sel, which is the uh, French sea salt, and gives it a nice little extra bit of seasoning at the end. You have a stronger relationship with the products when you know what has gone into, where they've been raised, who has taken care of them, the process by which they've come to our restaurants. And we all, as consumers, have to really be aware of what's going on with the environment and what the impact of different things in our world are on the future.